Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is Issues in Biotechnology, the way we work with life, and we're in part two, Applications of Biotechnology. So in the last lecture, we started on the component of pharmaceutical biotechnology with an introduction into how DNA-based biotechnologies are affecting emergent technologies today. And we looked at aspects involving the history of pharmaceuticals, uh, the origin of the FDA and why this is necessary for oversight on safety and uh, labeling issues. We looked at also alternative therapies and evidence-based uh, knowledge about those is required for a balanced view. Uh, then we also examined um, the development of vaccines and antibody-based drugs and led into recombinant-based drugs in general, um, as well as how pharmacogenomics is affecting small molecule drug development. So tonight, what I would like to do is to look at how the genomics era and post-genomics era will affect drug discovery and pharmaceutical technologies in general. And we need to consider here how knowing the genomes of humans and different populations will affect the development of drugs and this will be a foundation for how we consider uh, medical biotechnology in subsequent lectures. And pharmacogenomics. Uh, what does it mean now and how will it, it affect the pharmaceutical industry into the future? And remember, we stated as an outset to pharmaceutical biotechnology that the backdrop of this is really a consideration about the problem of human suffering. It in itself poses many dilemmas. How should we intervene? When should we intervene? Should we intervene? And the problem of human suffering itself poses many philosophical dilemmas that has been approached by great minds uh, for a very long time. And here's just a short list of some of the people that we considered. And um, certainly, you're invited to investigate what some of these people have thought about the problem of human suffering, but really it comes down to you, doesn't it? Uh, what do you think about it? How does it affect yourself, your relatives, uh, your children, and so on? So the genomics era. We are in the genomics era, actually. This is not something future. We can look at now how this affects us and how will it affect us into the near and distant future. We saw in the beginning part of this class that every single cell in your body contains a copy of your DNA. In a human, there are about, oh, 50 trillion cells, maybe 100 trillion cells depending on the individual, but we'll just go with 50 trillion cells that make up a human being. Every single cell has an exact copy or nearly exact copy of the DNA which encodes for you. Every single time a cell divides, it has to copy the language in DNA that is unique to you. Hopefully, that is without very many errors. So, given a high fidelity, high speed copying uh, machine as a cell, each copy of your genome is identical in every one of your cells. Already, I've used the word genome several times. What is a genome? Well, a genome is all of the DNA representative of that organism, including its genes. Genes carry information for making proteins. So genes, the code for the proteins in a cell, are really a small subset of a genome. 
In fact, in humans, there are roughly 24,567. Well, that, I said roughly because these estimates are not exactly determined yet. But this is far less than was first supposed when the human genome started. When the human genome started in the 1990s, it was estimated that humans might have over 100,000 genes, probably owing to our arrogant anthropocentric nature. Uh, and given that we already knew the genome of several other organisms, for example, the roundworm, which came in at 19,500 genes, and certainly were more sophisticated than a roundworm, uh, but actually not by, not by very much. On the other hand, we saw in the last uh, few lectures, in the first part of this course, that eukaryotic genes are actually broken into exons and introns. So there are maybe over 200,000 exons in a human genome capable of encoding 80,000 or more genes. So notice that the number of genes is greater, th the number of proteins is greater than the number of genes, telling us that a gene may actually code for more than one protein. And then there is a lot of DNA that is non-coding. And uh, some of this, we're still discovering its function. So genomes, the first genome to be sequenced uh, was the bacteria Haemophilus influenza in 1995, done rather painstakingly and laboriously by rather uh, primitive techniques in comparison to what's capable today. Then the roundworm genome, C. elegans, a genetic model uh, consisting of uh, several hundred cells, all of which are developmentally known, uh, was sequenced in 1999. Drosophila, the fruit fly, also uh, a genetic model that has been useful for studying genetics for uh, more than 100 years was sequenced in year 2000, followed by the human genome first draft, published in both Science and Nature in 2001. So you, we now know the genomes of many organisms and are adding to that list all the time. And we can now, through the use of computer databases of that genome, compare that information from one organism to another. Back in the days when microscopes were first invented, and even when Linnaeus was first doing taxonomy, biology was considered largely a descriptive science. Uh, look at this thing, describe this structure, describe that species, etc. And then finally moving into an experimental era, where physicists became molecular biologists in the 1940s and 50s. Now, as Eric Lander of the Whitehead Institute is quoted here, that biology is undergoing one of the most fundamental revolutions that any science has seen. It's changing from a purely laboratory science to an information-based science. And I think we can make the case that life on this planet is characterized as an information processing system. So for the last three and a half billion years, evolution has been taking notes. And I think we can also make the case that the information that is in the molecular structure of DNA is fluid, both in time and space. But the information in the base pairs of the sequence in this molecule predict traits that are governed by proteins. So the Human Genome Project was foreseen at its outset as a technology to decode the human body. Uh, I want to pay attention here to this. Is that really the case? Are you merely just an expression of your genes? Or is there more to the story than that? Well, here's the cover of Nature in which the first draft of the hum human genome was published in February 15, 2001. 
And we can see that on the cover is the double helix, but look more closely at this cover. Its backdrop is a mosaic of human faces, each one in itself unique, each face unique by the DNA that encodes it. But then notice also that the double helix itself is a mosaic of human faces. I think this is beautiful. And I mentioned that a lot of people presume that landing on the moon was one of the great achievements of the last century. And that is true. Certainly to get there and back was not only one small step for man, but one great giant leap. And actually to do that before computers was especially cool. To do this with slide rules only uh, and get there and back is uh, quite an achievement. However, I would also suggest that the accomplishment of landing on the moon pales in significance compared with recent advances in DNA-based technologies and understanding the human genome and its implications. During uh, that same month, science also did an issue on the human genome. I also think this is an insightful and beautiful cover for that commemorating that achievement, showing both the diversity of human faces racially uh, as well as developmentally through age. And so knowing the human genome and its complexity shows us our unique relationships to other people, where we came from, as well as our developmental biology. The mouse genome was subsequently published in December 2002 is commemorated on this cover issue of Nature. The mouse genome uh, also deeply informs us of our own biology. So again, here on this issue, I think it's insightful that the backdrop is not of mouse faces, but that of a human. And that the mouse genome depicted here, uh, the mouse depicted here on the cover, is also comprised of human faces. Why did they do that? Well, it turns out that when you compare the genomes of mice and humans, they are about 88% the same at the base pair level. And many of the genes are directly comparable. Um, and mice have many of the same genetic diseases that humans have, representing then a very good model for studying diverse diseases such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and even behavioral disorders like schizophrenia. So knowing the mouse genome provides not only a good working model experimentally, being able to do experiments that we wouldn't want to do perhaps quite yet on humans, uh, but also providing us with deep biological insight into uh, the genetic functions in the human. So the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine is famous as a repository for genetic mutants of mice. If you've ever been to Bar Harbor, Maine, it's a charming little village, um, a tourist attraction, no doubt, and um, the Acadia State Park is nearby. You can go cross-country skiing in the winter, climb Cadillac Mountain and see the sunrise for the first place on North America. That's all very good. But right there also, not on the bus tour, is the Jackson Laboratory, uh, one of the largest collections of mutant mice in the world that is useful for studying genetic diseases. Um, also, the Jackson Laboratory was recently successful in a bid to put up a laboratory in Farmington, Connecticut, associated with the medical school there and largely devoted to genomics and bioinformatics. So the mouse model will continue to further our insight into pharmacobiology as well as medical biology. The chimpanzee genome was celebrated in its completion in July 2004 giving us further insight into uh, the biology of primates and uh, our relationship to them. I think this photograph is also really interesting as the chimpanzee is holding a mouse, if you look closely. 
and in the background the human. So this article, this commentary uh, commemorating the, Jap the chimpanzee genome uh, is underscored as a bittersweet celebration. Why? Why bittersweet? Why? Why bittersweet? Well, actually, it's bittersweet because the chimpanzee is currently in threat of extinction. Um, they've been hunted and wantonly exterminated uh, to a dangerously low level, as have other primates that are close relatives to ours the orangutan, the mountain gorilla. So the mountain gorilla genome was also just recently published. Um, here on the left is the eastern mountain gorilla and on the left the western mountain gorilla and we see that in the, uh, in the past these uh, have been, um, the recent past have been shown to be mixing their genomes. Our understanding of the evolutionary relationships among species is now made more accurate and more highly resolved through the analysis and comparison of DNA sequences by their genomes. The more we learn, the more we understand how much in common we have with the rest of life around us. There are some genes you understand that are, that are very similar throughout many of these genomes. And these genes tend to have common function. Take genes that encode proteins that are involved in glycolysis. These are very similar in a pea plant, a cow, a whale, a human, and a chimpanzee. Uh, these all have a common function and have been highly conserved throughout life on this planet. So as we look at information as a basis for life on this planet, we can look at the process of going uh, from genome to gene, understanding an organism as a part of a whole in terms of an information system. How do we explain the information in DNA out to an organism that's capable of discussing it, let alone sequencing it? and then manipulating it. This is truly remarkable. That to understand the information that is comprised in DNA of base pairs that encode the information which makes genes that function then to exert traits. And that these traits then are selected for by environmental pressures, resulting in which genes are passed on and which genes are lost, which organisms are retained and which become extinct, and how this change occurs over time. So genomic technologies, really we can follow them in terms of uh, three basic ways. G genome sequencing, and largely I'm referring there to DNA. Uh, measuring RNA levels, which genes are expressed temporarily during development, but also in disease states such as cancer, and measuring and characterizing proteins, similarly that are also associated with developmental patterns and disease functions. So in the first, we're looking at basic uh, information in DNA. Next, the population of RNA, which is um, probably cell-specific, and we would call the first aspect genomics, and off of that, the RNA population would be described of as transcriptomics, and finally, the ecology and interaction of different proteins, proteomics. There have been other omics that have been described since, uh, network omics, um, etc. The omics of the day uh, is relative to who's probably doing that work. But this begs other questions, realize. Uh, there are philosophical questions embedded in the information that comprises us. Um, Time magazine came out recently with the cover article, What Makes Us Good and Evil? Is this 
behavior or is this a trait in humans that is deeply embedded in our genetics and therefore encoded by DNA? I had brought up the aspect of duality as it exists throughout nature and even chiral aspects of molecules, DNL forms, left and right. Well, look at how this is pervasive even throughout our philosophy. And is this now embedded in our DNA? We could also ask, are you really uh, just the uh, outcome of your genes? We have seen defense uh, mounted in criminal cases that say that a person could not help committing this gene because they had this or that genetic disorder. Some of these have actually even been successful. Is DNA your destiny? Is there such a thing as free will? Or are we merely a billiard ball just set in motion at the outset? Actually, a billiard ball that's already been hit by several billiard balls in the past. The biology of ideology. That study suggests that uh, many of our political choices, whether you're Republican or Democrat, for example, may be traced to genetic traits. How complicated is this? What is the network? I think these are all questions that are worth considering. But wait, let's get back to science and less speculation. Um, genome size is also interesting when you look at it in comparison to other organisms. I already said that um, the number of genes uh, that code for proteins varies widely among organisms. Many plants have close to twice as many genes as that of a human. But even the number of base pairs, uh, shown in this slide in the uh, millions of base pairs, where the human, that is Homo sapien, human, is 3,400 million base pairs, as compared to the newt, which is 84,000 uh, million base pairs. That's not Newt Gingrich, that's actually Newt the organism. Uh, and compared to the fruit fly, um, 180 million base pairs. So you can see that even um, what might be classified as a simple organism like an amoeba uh, has a very large genome um, base pair size uh, compared with its relatively simple organismal complexity. So this leads to some confounding or conflicting ideas about uh, genome complexity and the percentage of coding DNA found in various organisms also varies. So I mentioned that Humans are 24,567 genes or so, 200,000 exons that code for about 80,000 genes. So that leaves uh, about 98% or about that uh, that is non-coding in the human. Well, what's it doing? A long time ago, people used to refer to this all as junk DNA. Really? Some of it appears to uh, have functions in regulating which genes are on and off, silencing of certain genes during development and so on. Other parts of this segment that is non-coding seems to be related to ancient viral elements that are hitching a ride, so to speak, in uh, DNA replication. But we look at our 2% and compare that to the fruit fly, which has uh, uh, roughly about 19% of its DNA as coding, and the roundworm, uh, 25%. So the percentage of DNA that actually codes for proteins uh, varies amongst organisms. And it's useful, actually, to also look at that of uh, a bacteria. Many uh, less genes than a human although very highly conservative in the num number of genes that are expressed in that genome, upwards over 90%. So the entire genomic sequence uh, are now known for many species, including bacteria, fungi, insects, plants, and animals, uh, including humans and chimpanzees. And this list is uh, continuously growing. 
And uh, this type of analysis that compares uh, similarities and differences amongst these species is uh, now called comparative genomics. So as we analyze deoxyribonucleic acid and its sequence, the sequence of base pairs reveals much information, which is what it led Eric Lander to say that Biological sciences has moved out of its descriptive function, clearly, and it's moved out of its laboratory function and into largely an information-based science. Not that we've done away with descriptive biology, we still need that, or experimental laboratory biology, we still need that, but certainly the functions of knowing all of these base pairs, being able to analyze them is kind of where we are now, but when you look forward, certainly the ability to predict, manipulate, and change base pairs at will will have a large function in terms of medical and pharmaceutical technologies. So what is life? I think there is this misconception of DNA as being a static molecule, as if it were some sort of tape or some sort of digital code. Actually, digital code is closer to beads on a string as the way maybe a hundred years ago it might have been envisaged. And that the fluid nature of DNA uh, first was demonstrated strikingly by Barbara McClintock in the er late 1920s, early 1930s with the discovery of jumping genes, what we now call transposable elements, that DNA is capable of excising, moving, and reinserting. And we know this now to be the case of mobile elements within the genome all over the place. We also know that during meiosis, recombination results in uh, the transfer of whole chromosomal arms. So if you consider the DNA molecule in a standard depiction such as this model here, it's beautiful, first of all and striking in its symmetry, um, but you're a little bit lulled into uh, misconception by thinking it is static and that this thing exists and that the code exists like this and is somehow immutable. Hardly this is the case. I mentioned meiotic crossing over. If you look at this model here, it's this part transferred here and it shows you that by the lining up of this, that these molecules can interact, uh, delivering one part into another part seamlessly. So think of cut and paste in word pro program. You can take a whole sentence out of an unrelated document, cut, paste, move it, and that information is transferred. It's very similar with DNA. So you, the computer program is doing this with a series of zeros and ones. And actually, in the DNA code, we have a series of letters comprised of four different symbols. So what is life beyond your computer, which right now, as far as I know, does not replicate digital information? DNA is capable of replicating. That's very interesting. So life, I think one of the hallmarks of it is, is that it's an information processing system. All right, that doesn't differentiate it from your computer yet. It's capable of replication. I mentioned that every single cell in your body contains the code for you. And every organism is this way, and this has been interestingly demonstrated through cloning. So an information processing system capable of replication with variation. Every time DNA copies, one of these base pairs might be substituted. So in your 550 trillion cells that make up a human being, there is variation even within those for single base pairs, single base pair substitutions. And between humans, those small changes make up a large part of our variation. So an information processing system capable of replication with variation subject to selection by the environment. If we have a gene which codes for a protein and it doesn't function very well, 
This may create one sort of trait. If it functions in another direction, this might create another kind of trait, which would then ha be uh, selected for by the environment for its propagation. I could really get into that, but that's beyond the scope of this class. But that's interesting. Who considers life in terms of the basis of information in its processing system? So now we know all of the DNA that codes for a human being, a chimpanzee, a mountain gorilla, tomatoes, rice, roundworms, and various bacteria. This allows us then to do comparative analyses between these, but also knowing the genes is not enough. Knowing the sequence, what do these do? This is where we are now in what's called functional genomics. The composition of humans then is illuminated in their relationship to other life and how it functions.